OK, welcome to the Fashion Manifesto, how Gabrielle Chanel revolutionised the way that women dress. Um, on, the, on the back of this blockbuster fabulous exhibition at the Victoria and Albert Museum, we're delighted to welcome our uh, very distinguished panel. Uh, Tristram, wonderful to have you back at Cliveden. Last time you were here, you were talking about your latest book, which was on Josiah Wedgwood, the boundary-crossing radical potter as motivated in art as he was in political belief. Hunt is our own radical director, the former MP for Stoke-on-Trent Central, distinguished historian, um, and now director of the V&A. He's one of the great scholar museum directors of London, and under him, the Victoria and Albert Museum has become London's totemic museum. Um, luckily for us, <laughs> It's true. Luckily for us, Oriel Cullen chose fashion curation over fashion styling when she had the choice. Um, now she is the V&A Senior Curator of Textiles and Fashion and the author and co-author of many books, um, including the beautiful catalogue of the current exhibition um, on sale in the bookshop afterwards. Evidently a natural-born perfectionist, she has said there's no room for error when you're curating alongside Raphael cartoons. And then the wonderful Justine Picardy, whose multiple acclaimed books include her memoir, If the Spirit Moves You, and the international bestseller, Coco Chanel, The Legend and Life, for which she traced relatives and papers and the steps of the woman herself in a voyage of discovery. Uh, this revelatory moving biography, which has been extensively revised and published in a new edition uh, to coincide with the Chanel exhibition, uh, is available in the bookshop too, and there are signed copies, I happen to know. So, just a bit about the format of this. Today we will discuss the show at the V&A, and the woman herself, whose fascinating personal life and social safari informed her creations, and also the museum itself. Uh, for our starter, Tristram will enlighten us about the place of fashion within the V&A and how Chanel fits into the broader museum approach to dress and textiles. Then we'll discuss the show and the woman. And according to my notes from Tristram, at the end we ask everyone to become a member of the V&A, which, <laughs> which is now the only way we can see what we're talking about anyway, as we must if we haven't already, as it's been the quickest selling exhibition in the museum's history, selling out completely within four days. But you can still get in, he reassures me, if you buy a membership. So, Yay. Tristram. Well, uh, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Um, so. Well, Catherine, thank you so much. It's, uh, it's tremendous uh, to be here um, in uh, Cliveden, back in um, uh, Cliveden, talking about uh, Gabrielle Chanel, not least because we know that uh, Nancy Astor uh, was a patron uh, of Gabrielle uh, uh, Chanel. Um, and very interestingly as well, Justine's husband's great-grandfather purchased Cliveden. Uh, yes. Back in the 19th century, so it's all it's all from coming from the Duke round. of Westminster. From the Duke of Westminster, with whom, obviously, as we'll discuss, Gabrielle Chanel uh, was also uh, uh, connected, uh, along with Winston Churchill. And that's one of the great uh, elements in in the exhibition. Um, what I wanted to do was just say a few words before Justine and Oriel, who've done such brilliant work on this exhibition, uh, talk about Chanel. Just framing the place of. Uh, fashion uh, within the Victoria and Albert Museum. Our, our founding father, Prince Albert, um, who was, as was rumoured, keen on customising accessories, was always <laughs> wary of uh, over fashion. Uh, he advised the appearance, deportment and dress of a gentleman consist perhaps more in the absence of certain offences against good taste. Uh, but that never held back one of my great predecessors, Sir Roy Strong, who in a, in a beautiful diary entry uh, on the 11th of May 1974, this was just his sort of account of the day at the V&A, which begins, it was a gorgeous day, and I dressed elegantly in a flowered shirt, open at the neck and faded denim jacket. Uh, and that's how a director of the V&A should uh, dress. <laughs> so the V&A has the national collection um, of fashion alongside the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Ours is one of the great world collections, which means it's your collection because it's the public's uh, uh, collection. Um, and from Cecil Beaton to Grace Wells Bonner, Alexander McQueen to Harris Reid, we take, and particularly Oriel and her colleagues, take fashion very seriously because... We know it's of aesthetic importance in and of itself. We know that 
archival research, historical display, and our Fashion in Motion series, where new designers uh, put their works uh, on show in the museum, provide uh, an essential resource for makers and creatives today. And that was always the mission of the Victoria and Albert Museum. Prince Albert wanted us to be a, a storehouse, a treasury of science and art to inspire the makers and designers uh, of today. Um, and the v has been exhibiting fashion for over 100 years. When you do buy your membership and come and see the exhibition, you'll see uh, that one of the first items um, is this beautiful revolutionary jersey sportswear for women designed by Chanel in 1913. And that was the date that the Victoria and Albert Museum staged its first fashion exhibition. Uh, 16th to 19th century English costume from the collection of the painter uh, Talbot Hughes. And since then, uh, we have consistently grown uh, our array of fashion exhibitions alongside uh, the fashion gallery. A really important moment came in 1971 when Cecil Beaton organised the seminal exhibition Fashion and Anthology, a remarkable assemblage uh, assembly of the finest couture uh, works uh, from a fashionable elite. Six looks from Chanel there, and that really grows the collection at the V&A. John Pope Hennessy, uh, a very austere figure uh, within the history uh, of the museum, said in the aftermath of that exhibition, he affirmed dress as an art form worthy to be collected and displayed. And that gave us the green light uh, within the organisation. And since then, many of you will have seen the brilliant exhibitions that Oriel and her her colleagues have uh, curated uh, Vivian Westwood, The Golden Age of Couture, Alexander McQueen, uh, Mary Quant, uh, Christian Dior. That's the only reference. It's the only reference. It's just, it's just, it's just historical. It's just fact. Um, fashioning masculinities, where we looked at menswear, uh, Africa fashion, uh, and, of course, our finale, uh, Gabrielle Chanel fashion manifesto. So this is the suite where we end up uh, uh, today and our mission has always been uh, to explore the historical importance of these collections but also as I said to inspire the makers and the artists uh, and the fashion designers uh, of tomorrow uh, and I shall now hand over to my brilliant colleagues. Okay that, that was wonderful Tristram thank you so much for that inspiring in itself. Um, can we start with Justine Let, let's begin with Chanel's early life which was humbler and more deprived than anyone would ever guess I think thinking about the wonders of the house of Chanel. Born in 1883 at the height of Belle Epoque, France, she was raised so far from its decorative epicentre, wasn't she? Could yes. you tell us a bit about that? Yes, she was born in 1883 and she was born illegitimate at a time where this would have been a source of great shame and humiliation. She was born in a poor house and her father was a, a travelling market trader who sold ribbons and lace and needles and threads, all the elements that she would then use to create her brilliant career. But her father was a man always on the run from the mother of his children and from his children. And Chanel's mother died when she was 11. And Gabrielle and her four siblings were alone in one room in a tiny little market town at the time in central France as their mother lay dying. And then somebody, after her death, somebody went out to try and find a father. It took time to track him down. He was found and he subsequently abandoned his five children and never saw them again. So Chanel was effectively orphaned at the age of 11. And she and her two sisters were left in an orphanage that was run by nuns in a medieval abbey called Oberzine, which is an austere and yet beautiful place that I went to while I was researching my book. And extraordinarily, nobody at this point had ever gone to see where Chanel had grown up. And there at Oberzine, and I went there myself in winter, um, which was the time when Chanel was abandoned there, and it was even all those years later, you know, 140 years later, it was freezing, there was no hot water, no heating, and it's bleak. And I stayed, I slept in a little sort of iron bed where uh, the orphans would have slept. And it wasn't until I went there and slept there and stayed there and followed the nuns' routine because they only allowed me to go and stay with them if I followed their routine that I understood something of 
the trauma um, that she experienced, but then slowly the beauty too. So the nuns, and there was just a handful of nuns left when I went there, but they wear black habits with white cuffs and white collars. So, you know, therein lies the beginning of Chanel's sartorial lexicon. And there's a wonderful um, part of the brilliant exhibition where at the end of the exhibition, you see this beautiful outfit and it's from probably the end of Chanel's life. And it has so much in common with that nun's uniform. And there also in the stained glass windows, which are not figurative of the Abbey, you can see what looks like the inspiration for the famous double C logo. And there too, in the mosaic corridors that Chanel would have walked along from prayers, you know, morning, noon and night, in this pebbled corridor, which was made by medieval monks, you can see five-sided stars, crescent moons, Maltese crosses, and it's all there from her childhood. So this childhood, which was a source of such shame and humiliation that she really couldn't bear to talk about it in later life, yet, you know, in that place is the beginning of her creative genius. And I think this is true of every part of Chanel's life. You can't really separate the life from the work because whenever she goes through a period of, of trauma, of grief, of bereavement, of loss, out of that comes creativity. And that to me is what makes her so heroic, really, to be able to turn tragedy into creativity. Beautifully put and so interesting. Can you, so from this impoverished yet aesthetically inspiring sort of start, can you explain to us how did she make this incredible break into the world of fashion? Well, she um, left the nuns when she was 18 and she just had two options open to her. They'd educated her. She had beautiful copper plate handwriting so she could read and write and she'd been taught to sew. So she could have either joined the nuns and become a nun, which she certainly want, didn't want to do, although she dressed like one in certain ways. So she became a seamstress and she moves to um, a town where cavalry regiments were stationed at the time and she works as a seamstress there but she also works in a tailor's shop so she learns to do alterations gentleman's tailoring and there she meets a, ca a cavalry officer called Etienne Balson who is a rich playboy and as soon as he finishes his commission in the French army he leaves and he has a chateau about 50 miles outside Paris and a string of polo ponies and racehorses and a string of mistresses and Chanel joins as one of the string of mistresses and these mistresses this is the Belle Epoque so they are wearing you know enormous feathered hats and very elaborate gowns and obviously corsets and Chanel differentiates herself from the rest of these women by looking radically different and You'll see sort of images both in the exhibition and, my, and in my book of what she looks like. She starts wearing tailored riding breeches because she's riding, she's learned to ride, tailored riding jackets and white shirts, little ties and simple hats. So she gives herself the sartorial dignity and ease and assurance and comfort that has previously been denied to women. So again, in this period where, which could be one of humiliation, where she's not even the main mistress, she's somewhere between servant and mistress, she makes herself look different. She gives herself a dignity. Then she meets one of Etienne's friends, Boy Capel, who becomes the great love of her life. He's an Englishman, he's an industrialist, plays polo, and he, asks her to go to Paris, they move into Paris together, they live together, and he gives her the money to set up her first business in 1909, which is a millinery shop making hats. And from there, she swiftly 
develops this very unique style um, as we move towards the years of the First World War. And then during the First World War, she's already opened up a boutique in Deauville, which is a, a resort town. And she starts using jersey out of necessity because during the war, fabric is rationed. But she turns it again with a kind of, she, she prioritizes movement, comfort, ease. And this is an era where women are widely entering the workforce. Even aristocratic women are driving ambulances. They're working, you know, as nurses. And she makes clothes that reflect the somber mood of the epoch. So she becomes famous rapidly. And as a former editor of Harper's Bazaar and also having worked at Vogue, when you go through the archives of Vogue and Harper's Bazaar, her name begins to appear with infre increasing frequency. Gabrielle Chanel um, is the arbiter of chic, but she's also her own best embodiment of what is seen as the modern woman, the independent woman. And she's designing clothes that women can wear to the office, then go out in, ride a bicycle, go out dancing in. And thus her fame begins. Uh, wonderful. So, yes, so she once said to Dali that all, all she did was change men's fashion into women's by introducing, with the jackets and the hair and the necktie and the wrists. We all know she did much more than that. But it's almost impossible for her to imagine. I know you've got wonderful photographs in your book and in the exhibition of what went before her, the, you know, the sheer faff and the difficulty of all those bustles. But these, these masculine traits and this, we're very interested here in the Anglophilia that she had. So I know there was Etienne Balsam first, but then Boy Capel and equestrianism. Um, Oriel, just talk a bit uh, to us about what you saw in the actual, in the physical clothes. You, um, we'll go back to Justine on this because you, as you say, you can't separate the fashion journey from the personal life, really, can you? But mm. how did you feel in, in terms of, you've looked at men's clothes and women's clothes, how much men's tailoring do you think there is in there? Well, I think it's really interesting to look at the first garment in the exhibition, yes, which is this beautiful jersey tunic, which Tristan mentioned earlier. And it's um, this purity of line, minimalism, but also this idea of being able to move in the garment. Um, and of course, jersey at the time was very much used for men's underwear and sporting wear. Um, so not really something that you see in a couture. And I think throughout Chanel's design history, she's really pushing against the boundaries of a couture. And this, this mixture between utility and luxury and masculinity and femininity is quite evident. But she's always designing for the woman. So she's taking elements. She's not sort of taking menswear and, and sort of trying to, to scale it down or scale it to you know, the woman's body. She's looking at it from the point of view of the wearer. And I think that's very important. It can't be sort of overstated. Mm. It's this female gaze. Um, and she's solving problems. So this idea, there's a sort of ethos throughout her work that is about solving problems and, and coming up with a, almost a working uniform. Mm -hmm. Of course, men's wear um, was practical at that time. Women's wear was not. It was very constricting. You know, the woman had to fit into the dress. But this is very much about changing that um, and, and bringing elements of men's wear and, and sort of movement into women's dress. Yeah, um, wonderful. So, uh, Justine, on, on the Anglophilia point, so you have uh, Boy Capel, and then can you? Uh, explain to us a bit about how we get on to the Duke of Westminster and the influence that those sort of aristocratic British circles had on, well, her life and her work. Well, so Boy um, actually <laughs> betrayed Chanel by marrying an aristocratic young Englishwoman um, who he'd met on during the First World War when he was a captain in the British Army. And needless to say, he continued his affair with Chanel. Um, but as was often the case in her career, this young English woman who was the daughter of Lord Ribblesdale becomes a client of Chanel. And then tragically, Boy is killed in a car crash. Um, and he's already had one daughter with Di Diana um, and is pregnant with another child. But she carries on wearing Chanel. She becomes the Countess of Westmoreland with her next marriage. Then 
in the early 1920s, um, Chanel by then um, has already had a relationship with Grand Duke Dimitri. So she's um, met the Russian emigres in, in Paris. Uh, she's become friends with Diaghilev, Picasso, the Ballet Russe. She's really at the forefront of modernism. And I don't think you can overemphasize that, you know, Chanel influences Picasso. And supports so many of them, doesn't she? Exactly. Yes. But Oriol mentions the female gaze. That yes. is crucial. So at a time when women are muses rather than creators, Chanel becomes a creator of modernism. Anyway, fast forward, galloping through modernism and Picasso and Cocteau um, and Diaghilev, the Duke of Westminster, um, whose family home this was um, in the 19th century, takes a fancy to Chanel. He meets her, he's introduced to her by a mutual friend at the end of 1923 in Monte Carlo. And at this She's very famous, but at this point, he's certainly the richest man in, in Britain, possibly the richest man in Europe, and he starts courting her. At this point, she's, she's still involved with Grand Duke Dimitri, and I think she's not sure, having had her heart broken once by a, a, an Englishman, she's not sure she wants to go through it again, but she says, oh, I'm sure the boy sent the Duke of Westminster to me, almost as if the sort of English upper classes stick together, even in the afterlife. Um, she's also being courted by the Prince of Wales at this point. So at this point, she has Grand Duke Dimitri, the Prince of Wales, and the Duke of Westminster. Anyway, she's got she, standards. <laughs> she chooses the Duke of Westminster. And so by 1924, they're in a relationship which lasts 10 years, and she really enters British high society. And when I was researching my book, I went through the Duke of Westminster's private archives, um, but I also went up to Scotland um, to search through fishing archives and fishing records there. And you'll see in my book, it turns out that she starts in between working, you know, running her business in Paris and Deauville and Biarritz. She's also up in Scotland in the summers catching fish and she turns out to be a better fisherwoman than the Duke of Westminster and she starts wearing, adapting again his sporting garments, his tweeds. That when is, when is this the beginning of tweed? Exactly, it's but the of tweed in it's Michelin, also yeah. the beginning of her friendship with Winston Churchill. So Winston Churchill yeah. is one of the Duke of Westminster's closest friends, and Chanel and Winston Churchill meet each other, go fishing together, and Winston Churchill, who's happily married, it's not that he falls in love with Chanel, but he really develops what becomes a lifelong friendship with her, which is very important to remember. And he writes a letter about her to his wife and says, you know, she really is a great and strong woman fit to lead a nation. Mm. But he also goes to see her working in her couture salon in Paris, and he w leaves a wonderful description of, of how she works with her scissors and her needles and threads. And, and I think, and she also at this point, already actually, even before the Duke of Westminster, meeting the Duke of Westminster, she started dressing members of the British aristocracy, including the young Elizabeth Bowes Lyon, who will become the Duchess of York, um, and then after the abdication of Edward VIII, she herself is the wife of the king, so she becomes Queen Elizabeth, the mother of Princess Elizabeth, who becomes Queen Elizabeth. So you see this, the young Elizabeth is wearing Chanel from 1922 onwards. And it's really, when I discovered that in the Royal Archives, I was absolutely astonished by is that. Is it wartime that makes her think she has to swap to sort of British designers? Is it no, or, because this is 1922. But when did she stop wearing it? Or does she never, or does she always come back to it? Do well, it's, she carries on wearing yes. Chanel and even um, Oriol, you know, made this wonderful discovery about Queen Mary, you know, the arch-traditionalist. Yes. Yes. Um, 
it's, it's, it you know, is reported as buying a length of Chanel textiles mm. um, to use um, for a, a dress. She's totally part of the English aristocracy, but what emerges is something that becomes known as le style anglais, which fuses right. Anglophilia. And Chanel does her first um, British fashion show in the Duke of Westminster's private home in Mayfair in 1927. And, and as the exhibition so wonderfully demonstrates, in the early 1930s, she does a series of shows using models from British society in Grosvenor Square. In the exhibition, there is some wonderful video footage of this. It's sort of early catwalk stuff. It's absolutely gripping. And they're all sort of aristocratic models. It says young lady Pamela Smith comes on in her fetching sort of, you know. Yeah, I, I think it's just to jump in there about yeah, these, the textiles, do. British yes, textiles, yes. because as, as Justine mentioned with the tweeds, um, in the mid 20s with her relationship with the Duke of Westminster, Chanel meets William Linton of Carlisle producing tweeds um, and you know the Duke of Westminster's clothes are very much that hard sort of tweed that we know sporting yes. wear um, and she works very closely with Linton um, and with later with other tweed producers to create a fabric that's very different to what we might think of it's very lightweight it's an open weave and it's a lot of pliability and stretch in it um, which is quite beautiful and, and interesting colorways and interesting where did weaves. Where you get her inspiration from for her colours because there is a I very interesting palette in the exhibition isn't it? It's yeah sort of I mean I think that we do absolutely touch on the the monochrome which is very yes, important and, yeah. and Justine sort of spoken about that but there is and certainly in her later career there is an amazing um, em em she embraces colour and, and I think that's something with also back to the British textiles because mm. she sets up a business um, British Chanel Limited in 1932 and what was really surprising for us was to see the range of colourways, the printed textiles that she's creating. Um, she has a stable of different British manufacturers who are producing for her to designs that she's creating and they're manufacturing. Um, so we have sort of silks and walls um, from Ferguson Brothers of Carlisle. We've got Manchester Velvets, George Price of Nottingham producing Nottingham Lace. So it, it really speaks to the strength of the British textile industry that she's engaging with and, and quite amazing to see these fabrics and these wonderful dresses that we're it, able to show. It's so interesting to touch on her sort of methods there. I mean, Justine, she's very much a maker rather than artist, isn't she? She's quite dismissive about, what does she call them, the male sketchers who sort of do these pictures. She likes to have the body and pin and cut and she's never without her scissors. She's very much has yes. a sort of artisan approach to... Yes, I mean, she always saw herself as an artisan. She never mm. claimed the status of being an artist, but I would like to claim that for her. Yeah. Um, I mentioned Picasso, and uh, there's a painting that Picasso did called The Bathers in 1918. And as part of my research, I was going through the Picasso archives, and it turns out that Picasso it says how directly influenced he has been by seeing Chanel's bathing suits, w women wearing Chanel stripy bathing suits on the beach of Biarritz. And there's something about the color as well as the movement. Mm -hmm. And this is the summer that Chanel has designed. Um, Picasso marries his first wife, Olga, who's a ballet dancer in the Ballet Russe. And Chanel designs the wedding dress, but is also a witness at the wedding because she's close friends. And then they, that summer, the Picassos go on their honeymoon to Biarritz. Chanel has a boutique in Biarritz and happens to be there. And then Picasso does this wonderful painting, which you'll see in my book. And that is 1918. This mm. is before the Ballet Russe. So I will come to talking about her as an artisan, but I think she is an artist mm. too and the female gaze, but <coughs> nevertheless, there's a handprint, which was one of the first things that, that really gripped me in the Chanel archives. And it's one of the first pieces in the at Chanel exhibition at the v &A, and it is a handprint of Chanel's. And you see her handprint. Mm. And when you, as I've done, you know, been at the exhibition and watched visitors, they all often come and put their hands oh, up against Chanel's hands. And it's not just 
to see, you know, oh, how big was her hand compared to mine? I think there is this sense of connection, of touching her, of the sort of the veil between the past and the present becoming translucent, the living and the dead. And in that connection with Chanel's handprint, you understand so much about her and her signature is on the handprint and you'll see it in the exhibition. It says Gabri and then there's a little gap, El Chanel. El Chanel, you know, Chanel herself, Chanel the woman. And it's, yes, it's in her hands, but when I see, I remember my own response to the handprint and when I see visitors in the exhibition going through the same emotional response, it's that connection with a woman, with a woman's touch, woman's hands, a woman's gaze, the female gaze, which is so rare in art. It was for a palm reading, was it? She quite loved the sort of crystal balls and it was very fascinating. Magical the time, thinking, but... which is so much part of from her childhood onwards. She says that as a child, her first friends were the dead, that she sat in a graveyard. Um, and of course, you know, her mother dies. She knows mm -hmm. death so young. And she describes so movingly as a child sitting in a graveyard. And she's made her own, it almost makes me want to cry talking about mm -hmm. it. She's made her own dolls out of rags and dressed them. And she takes them to the graveyard with her. Mm -hmm. And she makes chains, like, you know, daisy chains of wild flowers and decorates her rag dolls with these flowers and sits and speaks to the dead. Mm -hmm. Margaret Atwood she, says yeah. all writing is negotiating with the dead. Mm -hmm. All creating is negotiating with the dead. And that is true of Chanel too. Which brings us on to her embracing black as a way of what both working through her own grief, but as a way of sort of making women's lives sort of easier in the process. Oh, yeah. what, do, what do you yeah, see absolutely. in the black? Because that was, before her, black was the colour of mourning, wasn't it? How did she move a colour? I, I mean, I really? think it, it was something that was sort of entering fashionable dress, of course. Um, right. You have yeah. a First World War, but by the 1920s, it is an element within fashion. And it's 1926 that Vogue famously sort of talks about Chanel's Ford and it's mm. a specific type right. of little black dress that she designs because it takes you from the daytime into the evening. So this idea again of something that's solving a problem that is, you know, at a point where women are dressing multiple times for different events during the day, she's creating something that will take you through. Um, and it is this particular dress that becomes so widely copied um, and a huge seller for Chanel herself. And we have a section within the show that looks particularly at the little black dress. And it's incredible it's to look. One, they all look so, I mean, they, yeah. anyone could happily put any of them on. I was amazed by how fresh they all looked. Well, my they mother didn't... got married in a little black Chanel dress, um, which was a very radical and subversive mm. thing to do in the 1960s. She'd known my father for six weeks when she got married in her Chanel little black oh, dress, gosh. and I was born eight months later. <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> For me, Chanel, the little black dress, has always been associated with radicalism, you know, rather right. than tradition. But I would also add to Oriel's very authoritative answer that Chanel takes the colour of mourning, which is widespread in the mm -hmm. aftermath of the First World War and the first global flu pandemic after the First World War, when everybody is mourning for somebody, everybody has lost a brother, a son, a father. And Chanel has lost Boy Capel. Mm. He's not killed in the First World War, but he's killed the following year in a car crash. So she talks about, she paints her bedroom black, she paints the shutters of her house black. She's wearing black as a symbol of mourning. And then out of her own grief, her own suffering, she emerges and turns black into the colour of independence, of resilience, of strength, and again of modernity. So the Chanel little black dress becomes synonymous in the 1920s with the modern woman, 
So the heroines of Scott Fitzgerald are wearing Chanel little black dresses. Oh, <coughs> wonderful. So she is, she is a sort of survivor in a way, isn't she? She can turn terrible tragedy into sort of opportunity, which sort of brings her, brings us really to the most sort of uncomfortable part of uh, her story, which is her Second World War. Tristram, how important is it for an artistic exhibition to put somebody in a political context? Do you think? I know when you wrote about Wedgwood, he was this great sort of creator and he had political beliefs. Do you think, how, how do we uh, weigh this into our assessment of a creative genius? I, th I think because the exhibition is Gabrielle Chanel Fashion Manifesto and we've heard mm. so brilliantly mm. about the, the biography, um, particularly for a UK audience, um, we had to explore um, the, the wartime years. <coughs> um, and, and what Oriel and colleagues have done and, and Justine's work is just show what a complicated time that was. And in that very, very kind of important understanding of history of, as it were, understanding yourself in time through a very, very brilliant use of archival resources. And what the exhibition shows for the first time, um, and you can go and see the material from the French National Archives, is that whilst Gabrielle Chanel had relationships uh, with um, a Nazi officer, um, she was also listed as a member of the French resistance. And what we do is just put that archival evidence out there, and very brilliantly we, we use the, the transcripts of the interviews um, of her to explore this really you know, complicated and challenging period. And, and, and I think for, for, for a London audience and for a UK audience, it's important that we um, explore that. Um, and there's, there's so many layers to it. Why do they, do, so am I right looking, that in the French exhibition they didn't have any of that? They did the, the fashion? And I then, mean, so I think context is very important, yes, of course, sure. because you know France was an occupied country. Yes. It's a very different story here. We're very open to talking I about see. war. Okay. And I think in, in France, the, the show is conceived of as a look at her um, design history. I see. So Whereas it's we're doing the life as well, well as the... Well, we're, we're including biographic elements, because mm. the other thing about Gabrielle Chanel is that she's a very well-known character in France, the, the Palais Galliera, where the show originated, is a fashion museum. Um, the V&A yeah. is a much broader, broader spectrum, um, okay. yeah. So I think it's important for us to have biographic elements. Just uh, yes, and as Justine so brilliantly said, you can't separate the woman from the life. These these new records, will you tell us a little bit about how you came across them and how you authenticated them and things like that? Well, I think that Winston Churchill is crucial. The relationship with Winston Churchill and the fact that she was, she was close to him. So when I st started researching um, this period, yes, she was having an affair with a, a German diplomat, of, I would say very pragmatic affair. Her nephew, who may well have been her son, um, Andre Palace, was serving in the French army when war broke out and he was one of those soldiers that when France fell to the invasion um, was taken to Germany as a prisoner of war. And she received a message saying he was in a camp in Germany and was very, very ill with TB, which is what killed her mother. So I think she would have done anything to save him. So she starts a relationship with a, a German diplomat. But I also think that and this is why you can't separate you know, the life um, sure. from the work, I, I would say. One of her closest relationships, her friendships, is with Winston Churchill. Also, one of her closest friends and former lovers was a French poet called Pierre Ravadi, who becomes very significant in the French resistance. So I'd always thought, and as the exhibition shows, she becomes involved with I would say at this point, um, disillusioned members of uh, um, the German hierarchy who by this point think Hitler is mad and are actively trying to get rid of him. And indeed one of them was arrested and sent to a concentration camp and executed. So in all the sort of furore about how Chanel, I think, has been wrongly 
sort of described as a Nazi supporter, which, by the way, I think is because of misogyny, everybody had ignored the fact that she was very close with members of the French Resistance and, indeed, with Winston Churchill. So I'm afraid I'm going to mention the Dior word once more, <laughs> which was the, a previous <laughs> book I wrote looked at Christiane and Catherine Dior, and Catherine Dior, who was Christiane Dior's younger sister, was in the French Resistance. So I started researching the archives of the French Resistance. Now, France, many of these archives have remained closed for a very, very long time because there's still a sense of shame and silence and humiliation about the occupation, being in an occupied country. But to cut a long story short, having gone through the archives in the past, they're just in sort of enormous cartons in you know, a warehouse in the middle of nowhere, and it's part of the French military archives. But it's only very recently that more of the archives are being released, which shows categorically that Chanel joined the French resistance from 1943 onwards, which makes complete sense to me, um, and is part of a network called ERIC, which is supply, and the French resistance was very fragmented. We think of it just as sort of one big network. It wasn't. It was impromptu. It was, it was secretive. But the resistance network that she was part of was providing intelligence to the allies in London. That makes sense to me. And, and even, okay, that, that, that's um, very well put. And one of, the, one of the many extraordinary things about this wonderful exhibition is the, that even after all that, there's this great resurgence. I was amazed to discover, which I, the, the tweed suit and the, and the handbags weren't even created. She created them in her 70s. Mm -hmm. Aurel, will you just tell us a little bit about her later career, where she has this sort of second very inspiring flowering. Yes, I mean, she okay. comes back into fashion in 1953 because she closed her house in 1939 at the start of the war. So in 53, she comes back together with the Wertheimer family and they support her to come back into fashion. As you say, she's 71 years of age um, and really what makes her name in the post-war period is the tweed suit. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think for us, we really wanted to dig down into that and show the sort of multiple variations of this suit that she creates within her And for her those version. who haven't seen it yet, there is this wonderful sort of room of double sort of, how would you describe it? I it, mean, it yeah, it's a, a double height display of 54 different suits. Right. Um, her first collection, right. her return collection is in uh, 1954, February 54. Um, and you can see, again, there's this incredible... It's like a fever dream of <laughs> Chanel suits, <laughs> sort of your head spinning with these wonderful sort of colours. Yeah. Uh, we're about to open up for questions. Just a, uh, so please, you know, have, have a think about what you want to ask. Just a couple more things while we've got um, Tristram here trapped on stage, which is how do you make sure, we're also worried about the British Museum, that people aren't going to wander in and schnaffle all these beautiful evening dresses out, <laughs> out the back door, no, as we all I, I might mean, want to if do. There's, if there's anything you like... Uh, <laughs> OK, <laughs> great. Sort of take, Another reason to uh, become the, a member. You yeah. can, uh, no, yeah. the, way we, the way we do that is having a really well-stocked shop, which you can go to uh, and then buy the catalogue and the other uh, material. But no, no, we do... I want uh, uh, you all to know, because this is your collection, this is a public yeah. collection, it belongs to you, uh, that, um, that obviously the V&A, along with you know, all, all the other national museums, takes the, the care and the security of the collections very, very seriously. And you can imagine we are all furiously auditing and re-auditing. OK, that's uh, so good to the, hear. That's exactly <laughs> what I wanted you to say. Good. Um, so... Now we will, thank you so much, panel. I'm sure there are some interesting questions, so please go for it. This lady in the second row here, have we got the... Uh... Hi, thank you all so much. Um, I had a question, well, I found it fascinating the way you describe how her childhood trauma, in a way, was sort of exorcised out of her through her designs. Incredible. But I had a question about influence, which maybe came from further afield. I, I noticed perhaps some, well, m maybe it's just I was looking for it, but I noticed that there were some um, iCat-like textiles from Central Asia, some textiles in the, in the room just before the, I think it was just before the jewellery 
um, some of the, the suits meal. there, which, yes, um, yes exactly, they, they mm. sort of were reminiscent of South Asian silk prints almost. And my mother was also married in a white <laughs> Chanel <laughs> shift, but it had, uh, I tried it on and it was a disaster, but matching trousers, which again, the silhouette was very reminiscent of a South Asian suit. So I wondered if there was that type of influence and how she would have come across that. That is such a brilliant question. So I'm going to answer some of it and then hands over to Oriel. So I would say biographically, so Boy Capel was very interested. Um, this was a period, it, he had a sort of, he wrote a book, he was an intellectual uh, as well as everything else. And he was very interested um, in Eastern and and South Asian um, writings, teachings, philosophy, and um, there's a, a picture that you'll see in my book which shows Chanel reading a book that he gave her where you can see what looks like those images. So this is a period where there is intense interest, I suppose, amongst, it's partly amongst um, intellectuals in the beginning of the 20th century. So Chanel undoubtedly, through Boy, would have come across that. Then when you think the artistic milieu that she's moving in in Paris, modernism draws on so many different cultures and Paris becomes a sort of melting pot for artists from and writers and thinkers from all around the world. And Chanel is at very much part of that milieu. And that's what makes modernism so exciting, where everybody is open to the idea of different cultures. And then again, through her relationship with Grand Duke Dmitri, but also his sister, um, who, these were Russians who um, fled the revolution and are penniless in Paris. And of course, you know, there is a link between that early Russian culture and Grand Duke Dimitra's sister, Marie, starts working with Chanel on embroidery. And those embroideries which, you will, which you're referring to, which are in the um, v &A exhibition, you can see all kinds of different cultural influences coming together. And now over to Oriol. <laughs> Well, also just to say that um, the space that you were mentioning uh, is something we, we added in the v &A exhibition, which looks at her cocktail suits from the latter part of her career. And um, really, you know, absolutely the textiles in there, these metallic brocades and lames, um, motifs like, such as the Bhutan motif, they're definitely taken from South Asian textiles. So I think she's someone who is actually very interested in in international cultures, but I think at that stage of her career, working very much with different textile merchants um, and, and choosing from what they bring to her. She's very open, isn't she, to sort of aesthetic, sort of inspiration and sort of intellectual inspiration. And yet, yeah, exactly. Said but what's a, where she's a genius is that she she draws on her own influences mm. and emotional experiences and reading, but she synthesizes this into something that always looks entirely itself. It never looks like anything else. And when you go to the exhibition, I'm s always struck by how every single piece within it, which when it was introduced would have looked revolutionary, the, the jersey pieces, the little black dresses, and yet becomes timeless. And you know, Chanel mm. says mode, passes, style remains, well, fashion fades, style is eternal. So out of all these different influences, she creates a sort of timelessness, an eternal style that never looks anything other, and let's go back to the handprint, than Elle Chanel. Mm. But this is, this is also just what museums do in the sense of exploring cultural appreciation and what we're more concerned about today, cultural appropriation. Yes. Uh, and, the, and, that, and, and, and having a museum which allows us the space to see how creatives and artists draw upon at different points and in different ways and in different sort of cultural and political contexts is really, really important to have that sort of space and not to be, in a sense, over nervous uh, about 
exploring it. Yes, and it, it does that wonderfully. Another question. I'm conscious we're running out of time. Where are the microphones? Okay. There's lots of Good. hands up. I know, there's so loud. And lots of hands up. Can we go down in the middle? This little lady in the central aisle. Um, just down here. There we are, this, la this lady here. And then we'll go to the gentleman in front of her. Yes. Right. First of all, can I say that I had the most wonderful hour and a half of my life going around the Chanel exhibition. Oh, I found it you. wonderful and very inspiring. But I have a very short question. Did, when she left the convent, did she... Did she ever have contact again with her siblings or did she just say goodbye? Yes, so um, she had two sisters, both of whom died in tragic circumstances, which tell you something about the tragedy of their childhood. So her older sister, Julia, killed herself. And Julia, um, who in theory had this son, Andre, who Chanel takes on as her own. It's possible Andre may have been Gabrielle's son rather than Julia's son, but Julia kills herself. And then her younger sister also dies in tragic circumstances, but nevertheless lives longer. And she starts working for Chanel at the very, very beginning. So when Chanel goes into business and then um, she dies, she, she basically it's another form of suicide um, in, you know, slightly later on. So Chanel is the survivor of these deeply traumatised mm. sisters. So, should we have another one? In fact, should we have two? And then we can, I want to fit as many people in as possible. So There's perhaps a lady we'll go behind you who's been yes. waving for ages. Go for it. And a gentleman here. Let's, uh, can we do, let's take two at once. Can we go lady and then the gentleman further? And then we can yes. just have slight quick fire just for a sense of sort of. <laughs> a question for Justine. You referred to your recent book on uh, Miss Dior, but obviously you touched a lot on Christian Dior himself. What were the similarities and differences that you found between Christian Dior and Chanel? Um, maybe there weren't any. Question in this room? No, I mean, <laughs> they are, well, they're, they're, they're the sort of twin, you know, yeah. th th they're both geniuses. I would say that the key difference between them is that uh, Chanel embodies the female gaze. So a woman dressing for herself and for other women. And and it's about comfort. I think Dior is, and, and both are very affected by the traumas of their lives. So that emotion, that ability to create clothes out of emotion. So you, for me, greatness as a designer comes where there is emotion. So it's what lies beneath the glossy surfaces, beneath the beauty, and both of them undoubtedly felt great emotion. But whereas Chanel um, creates with the female gaze, Dior is creating with the male gaze. And Dior, who launches in the aftermath of the Second World War, all the ugliness and horror of the Second World War, and he looks backwards to La Belle Epoque, the era that Chanel has been in revolution against. So he looks backward to this period before France's trauma during the Second World War, before the occupation, and he creates what's called a new look, but in fact is a very old look, which is, goes back to the Belle Epoque, where women are highly romanticized, highly idealized, corsets, beauty, very heavy dresses with corsets, and it's this romantic, rose-tinted look of beauty at a time when the war is still in such recent memory. But Chane Justine, this makes her furious, doesn't it? Yes, so and so Chanel Ooh. says, I stripped away corsets, you know, in 1910. I'm going to come back. This is why Chanel comes out Ooh. of retirement, because she's so enraged <laughs> by Christian Dior bringing corsets back. Marvellous. Another one? Yeah. Okay, yes. Uh, just 
Could you tell us something about when we when when did she start becoming known again as Gabrielle instead of Coco? I grew up knowing her as Coco Chanel. What what what's the shift and what 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 should we be saying today? Well, she there's many different versions of the story. I mean, she created her own version of herself. Um, but the widely regarded story is that when she was working as a seamstress in a tailoring shop in this town um, where the cavalry regiments were, she also sort of had a third job um, where she was singing um, in a little cafe theater. And um, one of the songs had a refrain about Coco, little Coco. So she becomes known as Coco Chanel. But it's interesting that she herself, you know, she's Gabrielle Chanel or she's Mademoiselle Chanel. So we started with reference to the Duke of Westminster and Clifton, and I'm going to end with this legendary story where she said there have been many duchesses of Westminster, but only one Coco Chanel. <laughs> <laughs> Tristram, we go shouldn't on. end quite there because Aurelie and I, yeah. uh, last night, we, we had breaking news uh, because um, there was this remarkable um, musical of uh, Gabrielle Chanel's uh, life, uh, which appeared on Broadway in... 69. Yeah, 1969. Is this the one where she's furious because she thinks it's going to be Audrey Hepburn playing her and it turns out to be Catherine? And yeah. so she, bo she boycotts. It's but yourself. amazingly, but. <laughs> we, um, we, we bumped into Sir Tim Rice last night, yes. who we think actually went to see the uh, yeah. musical and was very aware of all the lyrics and uh, components and <laughs> all the rest of it. So there's a, there's a Clifton kind of, you know, historical addendum uh, to Well, uh, so he Chanel's saw it life. even though she wouldn't. That's, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's wonderful. Have, have we got time? I just, we have to share. Go on. The other breaking news. <laughs> yes. The Queen. Oh, the, oh yes. Well, when we have exhibitions, often we get wonderful responses from the public. And we had a letter which came in last week um, from someone, um, and he said his family were the pharmacists to the royal family from the time of Queen Victoria to the Second World War, and they made the holy oil for the um, anointing um, new monarchs. And unfortunately, the yes, the coronation. So unfortunately, yeah. the um, deanery of Westminster. Cathedral was bombed during the war, um, and the recipe and the holy oil lost. But luckily, his aunt Mabel had saved <laughs> some of the holy oil in an empty Chanel Number no. Five bottle. <laughs> so, in 1953, uh, for the coronation of the late Queen Elizabeth II, they handed over this bottle um, of ostensibly Chanel this Number is the Five. This sacred moment, and no one was allowed to film. <laughs> Yeah. And so he said he liked to think that, you know, when the late Queen was, was crowned and, and uh, she smelt not only of holy oil, but also Chanel number five. That's, <laughs> that's incredible. <laughs> wow. Uh, 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 what a place to end. I feel rather yeah. overwhelmed. That's the most sacred I moment. I of, yeah, anyone can top that moment right. in Westminster Abbey, then be my guest. In the meantime, thank you to our wonderful panel and... Amazing books for sale in the bookshop. <laughs>